good to be with you this morning and good to have everyone here and I once again want to welcome all of our visitors and uh, welcome you to be back with us when you can. This morning we're going to be discussing that of freedom, that we have a freedom that is in Christ. Matter of fact, in our uh, study of uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, there is discussion in that book of freedoms and not taking that freedom, taking those freedoms uh, of where they should not lead. Just because we have a right to do something doesn't mean that we ought to do it all the time. Uh, that uh, with, with freedom, there is, there is a love that is to go along with it. Now, let's go to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61 just read for us, but we want to read it again. And this is concerning, does this concern Isaiah or some other man? This concerns some other man. This concerns Christ. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, if we were to go from this point to Luke chapter 4, we see in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus, beginning in verse uh, 16, Jesus goes to Nazareth. He's returned back to Nazareth. He has been gone from Nazareth. And there are numerous things he, he's begun doing. He has been doing them around uh, the um, Sea of Galilee in, the, in, the, in that area. And there are certain cities where he is gaining a reputation, but it's going beyond those cities, way beyond those cities. And actually, the news is spreading off into the Gentile world, as a matter of fact. And you would have people at home back at Nazareth hearing bits and pieces of Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, we know precisely who that is. And hearing things concerning Him. He returns back to Nazareth. Now, when He left, when He left, His ministry had not started yet. It was about to. It starts once He is pointed out by John the Baptist and is baptized by John the Baptist. That's where it begins. Of course, he goes, leaves there 40 days in the wilderness, and then he comes back full force in his ministry. Just uh, out from, uh, if the people have been prepared for it, John the Baptist has been doing that, and, and then prophets before John the Baptist uh, were doing that in the Old Testament. But he comes out in full force, and so there's a lot of things said. And let's just begin in verse 16. So we're Luke 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So it's Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those, liberty, those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20, Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him and began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's saying a lot. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's saying that. He's saying that he is there to do precisely what Isaiah wrote concerning, not about Isaiah, but concerning the Christ. Jesus of Nazareth is going to fulfill this. And what we want to look at this morning is that of proclaim liberty to the captives and to set at liberty those who are, are, are oppressed. It is that of this freedom, this liberty in Christ. Here is what we need to understand about liberty. First, is that liberty had to have a sacrifice 
and that sacrifice is extraordinary. For there to be anything like proclaiming liberty to the captives and there actually be liberty, or that of to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to be able to do that, there is a monumental sacrifice that had to be done, and it had to be done by the Christ. He's the one that had to do it. Jesus had to be sacrificed for sin. Because what are we being liberated from? We're not being liberated from men. We're being liberated from the effects of sin, which is far greater than what men can do to us. Sin carries with it a burden. It carries a debt, a debt we cannot possibly handle. We can't even pay the first penny of that debt. It's impossible. There is liberty that Christ gives, and it's a liberty that does not cost what it costs Christ. Now, we'll get to sacrifices that we have to make, yes, but the, his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and it's true. Compared to what the world and what Satan gives us, he is, yes, our Lord. He's also our Savior. He's also our advocate. He's also our brother. And he's a fellow servant. That's describing someone who is going to be very gentle to us. And also that Savior part means that he paid the price for this liberty. It did, it's not free. It's not free at all. It took the death of the Son of God. It took him coming here in the flesh, being born of a woman, being raised, being persecuted, and being crucified. Public execution for that cost. The cost of liberty. That is the cost. And this, once again, is not just a, a temporary liberty that one may have on this earth because there is no knowing what's going to happen from day to day. There's, you never can tell. You cannot tell what's going to happen. Except there are some things that I know only because God has told us, told us all. As long as the church continues, there will be persecution. As long as the world continues, there's going to be the church. And Christ comes and he's going to end it in the, the world and in this test on the day of judgment. When he returns, that's going to be the end of it. He's not coming to reign on the earth. He already reigns. He's king of kings and lord of lords. There's already a kingdom. The kingdom is established on this earth and it was his death that established it. And no man or group of men or nation or empire can stop that can stop anything. If God has determined to do something, man cannot stop it ever. Not by scheme, not by power, not by rebellion, not by attitude. You cannot stop the works of God. And there is a price that Jesus paid, and it was the sinless Son of God dying on the cross for us. But prior to that, he taught and he showed, by way of example, love and service. And he also showed us how we are to love others. And that love, we can see, that love and that service escalates in so many ways all the way to the cross. He shows us that. And with his blood, he purchased the church. With his blood, we have a new covenant, a new testament, the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty. All that has been given to us. And we now live in this final age of humanity on the earth. This final age under the law of Christ. This is the perfect law of liberty. But liberty still has a law. <laughs> liberty does not mean free of law. It never does. 
Uh, you, there, there are people who have deceived themselves thinking they are freest when they are their worst. No, they're not. It's a feeling, but not a reality. They are in fact slaves to things beyond their, beyond their control. God can get them out of it, but it's, and he shows the way, but it's going to be at their obedience and applying his way, applying his words. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. The perfect law of liberty. You know, there are sacrifices that have to be made on our part. I have heard of individuals on both sides of this, this particular, what I'm about to discuss. Someone who discovers they're in an occupation that they should not be in because the occupation is making them sin. I know numerous people like that. They, they, it was expected for them to lie, well, lie to customers or lie to superiors, and they didn't want to do it. They weren't going to do it. It required them uh, in things that are just ungodly, that it was just working on their conscience, and, and they knew they should not be doing such a thing, and they made the sacrifice. They made the sacrifice for the sake of their own souls, for the sake of those around them, because they're an example to their family and to others, for the gospel's sake, for Christ's sake, they got out of that and began doing something. They, and God's going to provide. He will provide. You do something for, the, for his sake. You do something out of obedience for him. You think he's just going to let you swing in the air. He's not. He's not going to leave you out to dry. He's going to help you. And it takes faith to do that. But I've known others on the other side of that where they were doing things that as Christians they should not have been doing. And they remained in it. And it wasn't good. It was not good. It affected them. Uh, and of course they died away in faith and spiritually. Their family was affected by it. They had liberty given to them, but they were not willing to make the sacrifices for that liberation, for the liberty, for the freedom that is given in Christ. Romans chapter 2, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, beseech them for what reason? That you may present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This service is reasonable. It's rational. It is not, not something that is just overly burdensome. It's not something impossible to bear. You can do it. And it is also expected of you. This living sacrifice means that if something is causing me to sin, I need to get rid of that cause, whatever it is. I need to get rid of it. Whatever brings me into the, the sin that, that so plagues me, I need to step away from that. If it's job, if it's friends, if it's, if it's family, whatever it is, we need to understand the very thing that's causing us to stumble. And there is a sacrifice that is going to be made. As we read earlier last week, I think it was last week, in the book of Mark, with that of the... Uh, rich young ruler in Christ speaking to the rich young ruler rich young ruler he wants to know what must I do to inherit eternal life Jesus says gives him uh, a few things that would be from the law of Moses doesn't give him everything gives him a few things and, and the rich young ruler says all these things I've kept since my youth so one more thing that you lack and then what he tells him is the man's weakness. 
Go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. He was not willing to do it because the man had great possessions. Those things possessed him. And Jesus begins to talk about those who, not just those who are rich, but those who love riches, who are taken by them. There is the deceitfulness of riches. There is the, the, the promise that, that is made, is usually uh, put right onto wealth that wealth cannot keep. It can't do it. But there are certain sacrifices we must make for our own sake and for those around us who we love. We want them to be saved as well. Certain things that, that we must do and liberty has requirements. But the requirements are not a burden. The requirements are easy. It's just a matter of faith. Faith in God, not faith in ourselves, not faith in others, not faith in man, not faith in money, faith in God. And I've seen it on the face of people before, of you try to convince them, and some, they get it. They get it. They just don't want to take the step. They get it but they're fearful. They think they're locked in place. Nah, that's all it is. You think you're locked in place. You're not. You're not locked anywhere. You're not locked anywhere. You can make whatever sacrifices need to be made. Now, with liberty, liberty, there has to be knowledge concerning liberty. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't have the foggiest idea concerning the liberty that Christ has to offer. Let's go to, to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and beginning in verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you abide in my word, well, if you don't know Christ's word, you can't, most certainly cannot abide in his word. You can't. It's not done by accident. It's not done haphazardly. It's done by full knowledge of what his word is. You, you can't guess it. You must know it. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So here he is abiding in his word. That is knowing the truth. That's, you have to know the truth for the truth to set you free. You have to know that truth. You have to know what it is. The world gives all kinds of things that it poses as the truth. It's not the truth. Let's talk about that just for a second. Men, first off, men can get things wrong. I know I have. Think that I know something and then correct it. Well, that's not exactly the case. This is what happened. Uh, you either heard it wrong or you made some assumptions or you misjudged There's something about it that, that you, got it, you got it wrong. All right, men, women, children, all of us can get something wrong. But there, that's the innocent side to it. That's the innocent side. There is the not so innocent side. That men can also, women and children, all of us can lie. Satan does at the very beginning. Genesis chapter three, there is a lie there, Eve believes the lie. She's been deceived. She doesn't know it, but she's been deceived. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's just apply it to, to Eve. Did Eve know what the truth was? Yeah, it had been given to Adam and Eve by God. That was the truth. Enter a deceiver, enter Satan, twists things and what do you have? You now have a lie that brings, with, with believing that lie, with believing that lie, are Adam and Eve made better or worse? Worse. Their life is completely changed because of that. 
their situation. They were sinless, now they're in sin. Now the world has been changed. And in fact, heaven has been changed. Though the Christ was in the foreknowledge of God, the plan of salvation was in the foreknowledge of God, now it's got to be done. It has to be done. It is now that the, you have the promise there in Genesis chapter 3, 16, 15, that of the, there's someone who's coming for the sake of sin. He's going to arrive in time. In time. Now, it's going to be a long time before he gets here. But in time, he will. And, of course, that is Jesus. And he will be born of woman. Exactly as God states there in Genesis 3.15. Now, with that, with that, believing they knew the truth, and the truth kept them free, but believing the lie, the lie didn't make them free. The lie didn't improve them. The lie didn't make them as gods. It didn't make them like that. It brought about sin. That lie brought about sin. And they're not free anymore. Jesus states here, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth has that power. Like the person who thinks they're locked in, that they're locked into a station in life and they can't get out of it, or that's a lie that they've just convinced themselves of. That's just a lie. They can get out of it. They can walk away. They can walk away and whatever, whatever it is, whatever sin it is, they can walk away from it and correct their life. They can do it. That is freedom. Here's the thing about Satan. Satan is going to pile on us Burden upon burden upon burden upon burden. And as long as we carry those burdens, it doesn't go away. He doesn't suddenly become nice and start taking the burdens away. He's not going to do it. Nor will he. He is a cruel individual. He's extremely sadistic. He is insidious. He will put more on us and laugh all the while. He is wicked. He never takes it away. The worse it is on us, the more he's delighted by it. He has no compassion. He has no mercy. He has absolutely not the first fiber of love. Nothing like that exists in him. Nothing. He doesn't bring freedom, and people who have, who have believed that somehow they have freedom away from God, well, reality is going to show itself, and you might want to take reality's advice and understand it's not freedom. Freedom comes with God. Now, we come to our next one, that with freedom... There is righteousness. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. Liberty in Christ is, in fact, liberty from sin, not liberty to sin. It's liberty from it. And I have come across people who claim they, they have a respect for the Bible. They've been taught wrong. They have a respect for Christ. But they would say just the opposite. They'd say the opposite, that the liberty we have in Christ, once saved, always saved, therefore we have a liberty to now sin all with a good conscience. But that's not the case. We go to verse 1. So Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then the next words in verse 2 are, in reading from the New King James, certainly not. Certainly not. And that is the best they could do in rendering the two words in the Greek. The two words in the Greek are me genata. 
which mean what? It is the strongest negation one could have, I think, in that language. It's strongly saying no, absolutely not. It's not, it is not something that is potential ever. It's not anything that is possible ever. It is completely saying no. It's not possible in the present. It's not possible in the future. It's not potentially anything that we are not to sin that grace may abound. We are to follow the words of Christ that leads us away from sin, leads us to righteousness. Righteousness is demanded, in fact, engendered by this liberty, true liberty found in Christ brings righteous behavior. We don't have a, a Savior who is an example of wickedness. Why would he be an example of good if we can behave just the opposite? If he allows us to behave just the opposite? Why would he do that? He's an example for us to follow him. And yes, we can fall away. There are individuals we can look at from the New Testament. Judas, was Judas saved? I'd have to say Judas had to have been saved. He is, he was an apostle. He was one who was performing miracles. Matthew chapter 10 states he's, he's one of the twelve. He's one of the twelve who were sent off to do those things. It doesn't say, and all of them did it except, except Judas because he wasn't saved or he wasn't really an apostle. They all were doing it. He fell away. He fell away. But so too did Demas. So too did others that we can, we can see. We can see where, where Peter sins and returns and we see where uh, see, uh, Peter sins more than one time we see uh, there uh, at the the trial that Peter denies knowing Christ but we see further on in his life places like Galatians chapter 2 where he has a serious problem and it's a problem a weakness concerning that of social pressure from certain groups all right that's an issue that's an issue. That doesn't make him right before God. And as a matter of fact, that's, let's, just, let's just go there. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was, not, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. So is that good? No. So that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not, look at this, they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. They were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. What is that? That is twisting the gospel. That's obscuring parts of the gospel. That is not having the truth, maybe a portion of the truth and something else added in. They're not straightforward with the gospel. Now, I said being, I said, oh, sorry. I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as of the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? All right, that's kind of a complicated way of saying things. We can just all fit it together very easily in this, is that Peter acted one way with the Gentiles, and when you have certain Jews that came, he acted completely different, separating himself, separating himself with them from the Gentiles. Not, But the point I want to bring out in all of this is he's not being straightforward with the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel, meaning that he is, he has, is removing himself away from the truth. Certainly, if you are not teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, if you're not doing that, you're not teaching the whole truth of the gospel. And if you are purposefully obscuring it, that 
that is being a false teacher. That is being selective as to what you want people to hear and what you don't want them to hear. God needs us all to hear everything he had to say. But righteousness, righteousness is engendered, it's brought about by this liberty and demanded by the liberty, obviously. Obviously, if we are to be free from sin, that doesn't mean we go back into sin, though we can, and we do, and we need that advocate, we need that Savior. We need the words of the truth to help us through those times and return back to Christ. We need that. But now, let's go to chapter 5. So Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, beginning. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Through love serve one another. So we don't take this liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. We don't take this liberty and then take us back to carnality, take us back to, to things in the world, take us back to the pollutions of the world and what the world loves and what the world wants to, wants to have and wants to show off. We don't do that. We take this liberty and we serve one another in love, which takes us to our next point in this, is that liberty brings love and demands love. Let's, let's continue in verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The perfect law of liberty is what he's talking about. Now, all the law of God brings about you shall love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws that he has given throughout history has also incorporated this. But to fulfill, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, to love everyone. And that includes neighbor. That includes those who harm you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Here love is described, and this is liberating. And here are words that help us in understanding the liberty that we have in Christ and the unity that we have in Christ. Those that have been liberated from this world, liberated from the power of Satan and of sin and of condemnation and of guilt, those who have been liberated in this, they, they're going to be united because they're going to have a shared characteristic, a shared characteristic, and it, topping that list is going to be love. Topping that list. But there are others. Dedication. Knowledge. Of course, that knowledge has led them to that love. Uh, that of faith. That of works. There are things that have united them and united them in the church, united them in the family of God, united them in this army of God, united them in this royal priesthood, united them together. And we just look in, in how love is described. And this is the highest form of love. Verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. It's not arrogant about itself. Here are words of truth and truth that sets us free. Here are words uh, under the perfect law of liberty and they do that. The law of liberty brings liberty. The truth, when followed, the truth shows liberty, when followed, brings liberty. Verse 5, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Now, we can just, we can just look at what's common today, and do we actually see this in people, in the world? And if we were to be able to go back in time, we could ask the same question. Ask the same question. Do we actually see this in people that are living lives away from Christ? Do we see this? No, we don't see it. 
Someone, someone can have uh, uh, good attitudes in certain things, most certainly. But it takes all the truth. It takes the, the truth, not portions of the truth. It takes the truth to set someone free. And it takes obedience to Christ to have salvation. And that's knowing the truth and everything we need to know concerning salvation. Per, uh, is not provoked, thinks no evil, verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Then conti continues on, love never fails, meaning love is eternal. Love Love, whether it's e eternal in, in a person or not, it's a different matter. All right, that people can fail. But love as something that exists is eternal. God is love. His love goes from everlasting to everlasting. And it's a love that goes beyond just us. Uh, there are other things that God loves, righteousness, all things that are holy, things that God has uh, created, though he doesn't have the same love and care for the planet Jupiter that he does for humanity or for cattle that he does for humanity. But actually the love he puts in to, and the care that he's put into this creation is centered and focused towards us. Us, all working behind the scenes so that we can continue here. Christ did, in fact, do what he said Isaiah prophesied he would do. Going back to Luke chapter 4, we just read it again, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, there is liberty being proclaimed and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And there's another proclamation to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the time to accept Christ. Now is the time to accept salvation and the law which sets us at liberty. The law which gives us, truly gives us freedom, and that's eternal. That is eternal. It doesn't end at the grave. It goes way beyond that. And things that are eternal, I don't have to say this, but I will because it's obvious, never end. It's endless. Christ will return and Christ will judge every single one of us and he has supplied everything including the sacrifice so that we can be have every spiritual blessing so that we can be in heaven so that we can live right on this earth the way that we should be living what is best for us what's best for everyone and what God expects out of us all that has been done has been paid for in advance before we were even born and it's set now for us to accept. And this has been presented lovingly by him, providentially kept in place so that by the time we're born, it's here for us. And these words, this liberty uh, in the law is precisely what we're going to be judged by in that last day. And this perfect law of liberty tells us how to be saved so that we can have our sins forgiven. And we don't have to stand in before that judge with condemnation, the full weight of sin still on us. We can have that removed. We're not locked into place. The words tell us of that freedom. And that freedom shows us in those words that we're to have faith in those words. Faith in those words means being obedient to them. That These are the words of God, and they work. Every single time they're applied, they work. And with that faith, we apply those words where we are to 
repent of our sins, a new life awaits us, and a new behavior, a new person, a better person awaits us. And we are to confess faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and be baptized, and our sins are forgiven there, and we are brought into his kingdom, a kingdom paid for by him, a kingdom established by him, a church where he is the chief cornerstone. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the one that gives us this liberty, and we can accept it or reject it. We ask this morning, if we can help you in any way, if you need to respond to the invitation, that you come as we stand and sing.